Okay, so we're on part two of chapter um, two, <laughs> neuroscience. So we're looking at David Meyer's eighth edition psychology textbook. So where we left off was looking at this. So we're going to go ahead and delve into the nervous systems. So when we look at neurons, we look at sensory and motor neurons. So sensory motor on, motor, um, sensory neurons bleh, carry incoming information from the sense receptors to the CNS. And then motor neurons carry outgoing information from the central nervous system to the the muscles and glands. So sensory is carrying incoming information from your sense receptors to the CNS. Sensory incoming to the CNS. Motor neurons outgoing from the CNS to the muscles. So motor neurons outgoing to muscles. Sensory incoming to the CNS. I know it's confusing, just make sure you know it. Inner neurons connect the two neurons, okay? So glia cells, um, what you just need to know about glia cells is that you're looking at something that helps with the nutrition of your neurons. Um, when we look at the peripheral nervous system, the PNS, we're going to look at the somatic and the autonomic nervous system. So somatic is the division of the peripheral nervous system that controls the body's skeletal muscles. Somatic skeletals, SS you know easiest way autonomic sounds like automatic so that's what you need to know it's the automatic nervous system so you're going to get things that are automatic things you don't have to think about so with nerves they're just like the cables throughout our body and these cables throughout our body are going to help send messages throughout um, and these ner these things these n n cables if something goes wrong with them then that part of your body is not going to be operating perfectly so when we look at the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system, I want you to think about stress and I want you to think about peace. So in the sympathetic nervous system, it's when our body is under a stressful time, our body has to mobilize to react to it. So sympathetic nervous system is just automatic. You, when you're under a lot of stress, you feel that adrenaline pumping through your body, you feel your heart rate increasing because of the sympathetic nervous system. It's called the fight or flight syndrome. So your body is preparing the fight to keep going or it's going to flee the situation. In the parasympathetic nervous system, this is when your body is going to calm down. And this is when your body tries to get back to homeostasis, which is your normal level. And so in the parasympathetic nervous system, I want you to think about peace. So sympathetic is stress, parasympathetic is the peaceful time. So we talk about this as being the fight or flight. And if you look at here, this is just a pretty good outline of what the autonomic nervous system does. Um, so like um, when um, you hear, you know, that there's a, I don't know, let's say a fight on campus, you do this fight or flight syndrome, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Either you're going to run to the fight or you're actually going to run away from the flight. But the reason why you can keep running even though you're out of breath is because your body is aroused enough to keep you awake and to keep you strong enough to keep running the five miles it takes to get clear of the situation. And then once you're done running those five miles, and who wouldn't be exhausted from that, your body is going to calm down, and now you're going to be in the parasympathetic nervous system. So spinal cord and reflexes. So when you look at the central nervous system, remember the spinal cord is like the information highway of your body, and it's going to send the messages throughout. If your spinal cord is damaged, wherever it's damaged, that's where the communication in your body is going to stop. So people who have um, broken their neck, okay, right here, They've actually broken it. Um, yeah, they can still live, but they're living with the help of equipment, with medical equipment. Now, all the information down this way ceases to exist for this person's body. Um, and it just depends on where this is broken. So when we look at the central nervous system, we look at the brain and the neural network. So interconnected neurons from networks in the brain, these networks are complex and they modify with growth and experience. So our body can actually adapt to changes in ourselves. So the endocrine system, this is the body's slow chemical communication system and communication is being carried out by hormones synthesized by a set of glands. So we look at the pituitary gland, uh, which is known as the master gland and this is going to secrete your hormones throughout your body and it really gets you ready for puberty. Um, we, go, we look at thyroid and thyroid is just like your metabolism. Parathyroid is regulating the calcium in your blood. 
um, and it's a part of your thyroid, that's why it's para, it's with it. Um, hypothalamus is just the brain region that controls the pituitary gland. Adrenal glands, this is um, the inner part called the medulla that helps trigger the fight or flight syndrome. Uh, then we look at the pancreas, this regulates your sugar in your blood, and the ovaries are for females, um, and testes are for your guys. So hormones, this is just going to be chemicals that are released throughout our body, and it's thanks to the endocrine system that it's released, and this affects everything in our body. So adrenaline is going to increase your heart rate, blood pressure, blood sugar, and feelings of excitement during emergency situations. So right now, you guys are probably having a lot of adrenaline pumping through your body because you're preparing for this AP exam and five million other ones, and that adrenaline just keeps you going, and at night when you go to bed, it's like 2 a.m., and you can't even sleep, and you wake up at 4, and then you want to study some more and I know I'm just joking with you but that is adrenaline um, and it keeps your body going it's why people can go weeks without really sleeping that much is because the adrenaline just keeps pumping in their body the pituitary gland known as the master gland this is the one that tells our body that hey it's time to be an adult and so it's gonna let our body start to become uh, in that puberty period so when you look at the thyroid and you look at parathyroid, this is your, meta uh, your metabolism. And so this is going to help you um, burn the calories that you need to, to maintain. Now, when you look at the adrenal glands, they consist of the medulla and the cortex. The medulla is going to secrete hormones like adrenaline and non-adrenaline during stressful and emotional situations, while the adrenal cortex is going to regulate salt and carbohydrate metabolism. So um, that's good. Now why I say that's good is that um, this stuff can actually go wrong in people's bodies and sometimes that is why people have um, things like diabetes and you know it's just this part of their body might not be working quite as well. Now gonad sex glands are located in different places in men and women. They regulate your bodily development and they maintain our reproductive organs and adulthood. So the brain, we can lesion the brain. Now, if you lesion the brain, it means you're damaging part of the brain. You're never going to ever, 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 ever get it back. Once a brain surgery has done this, it's not like you're like, oh, well, sorry, hon. We're going to go ahead and glue that back in. It's damage is gone. It's never coming back. Um, so here's just the lab. And what they do is you can see all these nice little brains. They're trying to figure out what these brains mean. <laughs> so we have, you know, the abnormal brain, and then we have the normal brain. Um, and so they're trying to look at what um, psychiatric diseases might be able to look at the brain and see how we can maybe alter it later. Um, EEG is just a way to look at a person's brain. Now you can see the little girl is um, hooked up to EEG. EEGs are good. Um, now they're really good for like sleep studies. This is typically where EEGs are. PET scans are looking at a radioactive glucose um, form in your brain. And so this is another thing that we can do um, when we're looking at trying to figure out what's going on with some of the brain. Uh, MRI is another brain scan that we look at. And an MRI um, basically is just magnetic waves of the brain, and it's normally used for like concussions and brain trauma. So like some of you who are athletes, you might have had an MRI before. Um, then there's this other thing called a functional MRI, and a functional MRI is like with a lo lowercase f and then MRI in capitalization. This is magnetic waves of the brain by measuring your blood flow and oxygen levels in the brain. It's pretty recent. Uh, when you look at like um, pet, you know, the easiest way to remember a pet scan is if you cook, um, pet milk is sugary, okay, so it looks at like glucose. Um, and MRI, I mean, I don't really know what else to say there. Magnetic, you know, it's easy to remember. And then a CAT scan or a CT scan, this is just an x ray of your brain. So there was two extra ones I added in here, but hey, I'd rather be safe than sorry. So when we look at older brain structures, we look at the brain stem. This is the oldest part of the brain, and it begins where the spinal cord swells and enters the skull, and it's responsible for automatic survival functions. So we look at the medulla. This is the base of the brain stem that controls heartbeat and breathing. So medulla, metal, it goes over your heart. Remember um, Dr. Britt's video. Um, and so if you don't know what I'm talking about, remember the Dr. Britt video where he does all these weird little things to help you memorize the brain. I strongly suggest you go back to it because he's far more clever than I am at um, 
doing these nice little mnemonic devices. Reticular formation, what makes you tick? So this is arousal. Um, then we look at thalamus. This is the brain sensory switchboard, and it's located on the top of the brain stem. And so this is um, going to do messages. Okay, so switchboard messages. It's like the old, you know, secretaries how they used to uh, switch little buttons and get your messages to you. Cerebellum, this is the little brain, and it's at the rear of the brain stem, and it deals with voluntary movements and balance. Okay. When we look at the limbic system, this is the donut shaped of our brain, and this is going to have things like emotions, fear, aggression, drives for food and sex. And in the limbic system, we have the hippocampus, the amygdala, and the hypothalamus. And so you need to know that within the limbic system, it houses these things. So amygdala, angry, Amy, it deals with fear, it deals with anger. And so what we see with the amygdala is like with our um, serial killers, our people who have antisocial personality disorder, sometimes their amygdala is a little bit larger than everybody else's. Um, and so that might be why they're so angry. Now when we look at the hypothalamus, this is hypo, it means below. So it's below the thalamus and it directs like our maintenance. So this tells us to eat, drink, body temperature, and it should be able to control our emotions. So this is in, um, it's a part of that pitu uh, pituitary gland, but just know that it's dealing with your emotions, your body temperature, and eating and drinking. So when we look at our body and we look at trying to do rewards, what we do notice is that we can manipulate people to eat or to uh, get that reward in their brain signaled off. So rats cr um, cross an electrified grid. Again, it's okay because it's animals and we're trying to learn about humans. So as long as we learn more information, we can experiment with animals. So it crosses the electrical grid for self-stimulation when electrodes are placed in the reward center in the hypothalamus. So it'll cross that grid, get ugh, a little shocked. When the limbic system is manipulated, a rat will navigate fields or climb up a tree. So, hey, as long as they're getting some sort of reward, they'll go ahead and get a little crispy that day. So the cerebral cortex, the intricate fabric of interconnected neural cells, it covers the cerebral hemispheres. It's the body's ultimate control and information processing. So the cerebral cortex is that fleshy stuff that you see. Um, and if you've ever got to see a real brain, that's, you know, the nice gray kind of matter. Structure of the cortex, each brain hemisphere is divided into four lobes. So I want you to know these lobes, frontal, parietal, occipital, and temporal. So frontal is your forehead, um, and it deals with like judgment. And we've noticed too with people who are antisocial personality disorders or people who were like, you know, they have committed some seriously bad crimes. If you look at that abnormal stuff, I've showed you some um, scans of the brain. They don't have as much activity in the frontal lobe as other people. Yeah, and then the parietal lobes, this is your um, touch, okay? And then when we look at occipital lobes, occipital eyes, and then temporal is hearing. Uh, we look at motor cortex and sensory co cortex. So motor cortex is the area at the rear of the frontal lobes that controls voluntary movement. So movement, motor, okay? And then sensory cortex, this is receiving information from your sense, your skin sense and it goes to your sense organs. So motor cortex moving, frontal lobe, and then sensory cortex, skin, sense organs. I think that's pretty easy. So visual function, so this is that functional MRI. It shows the visual cortex. It's active. You're awake. They're looking at your brain. Auditory function, the functional MRI can also look at how someone is hearing something and it can be active in like people who are hallucinating, so you could do this for our schizophrenic patients. Association areas, I talked about that at the first part. What we've noticed is that um, people or animals who are more intelligent, uh, they have more association areas in their brain. Um, aphasia is just an impairment of language, and this is normally because there's been some damage to the less, left hemisphere, hemisphere ugh, damage, and this is either to the bronchus area or the Wernicke's area. And so if the bronchus area is um, in, impeached or, or hurt, it's going to be with speaking. And then Wernicke's area deals with impair, impaired understanding. 
Um, and I know you guys know this. Like uh, for people who have strokes, it's the bronchus area that can be damaged. For the wernix area, it's just that they might not be able to understand you. They have an impaired understanding. So specialization and integration. So brain activity when hearing, seeing, and speaking words. Um, our brain has certain areas that deal with this stuff. Bla uh, brain plasticity, it just refers to the brain's ability to modify itself after some type of injury or illness. So your brain can go on, it's just got to modify and correct and then it, it moves on. So our divided brain, we look at the right and the left. So left hemisphere, it processes reading, writing, speaking, math, and comprehension skills. And we saw it being the dominant brain in the 1960s. And we'll have to go on to part three, sorry.